Sorry we're a bit late, I was just chatting in the vestry, so it's all my fault, sorry. <laughs> On this last day of 2023, we sing 330, Joy to the World, the Lord is Come. So fill us with your spirit, that we are set free to wonder and adore you. Wonder of wonders, mighty God, that you should come as you did, the creator of all to share our flesh and blood. We need your spirit's help to see it and take it in. Born just like every one of us, yet how much more? Born to draw love from loving hearts. Born to draw worship from trusting and adoring hearts. Born to draw fear and hatred too from hardened hearts. Born to bring love to those who know they need it. Born to bring, bring judgment to those who cling fast to the world and reject your love. Born in time to be the Lord, the Saviour, the judge of all, born to be the way, the truth, and the life for us all. God of wonders, our minds cannot grasp, our words struggle and fail. We need your help. Set our spirits free by your spirit to see, to wonder, and to adore. Amen. We listen now for the word of God. <coughs> the reading is from Paul's letter to the Galatians. And I'm reading from the Good News Bible, which I find easier not only to read, but to understand. But when the right time finally came, God sent his own son. He came as the son of a human mother 
and lived under Jewish law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might become God's sons and daughters. To show that you are his sons and daughters, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who cries out, Father, my father. So then, you are no longer a slave, but a son or a daughter. And since that is what you are, God will give you all that he has for his heirs. Here ends the reading. Thank you, Bob. I'm, I'm with you with the versions of the Bible. I think the good news is always a lot easier to understand. We sing again the hymn 193, Born in the Night, Mary's Child. <laughs> So in our reading this morning, I just want to, hopefully not at great length, but to draw out four points from the reading. The first point is about God's timing, and specifically from the reading, when the right time finally came. Secondly, I just want to reflect on how God is, as opposed to trying to describe what God is as an object, to think particularly about how God operates in the, in the world. God isn't just there, God operates and supremely, God's love in action is demonstrated in Jesus, uh, whom he sent, God sent his own son. He came as the son of a human mother and lived under the Jewish law. And then thirdly, to reflect on what it means to be this sounds like it could be a very long term, to be a redeemed and adopted. And then finally, and I think briefly, um, about the fact that God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts and that we are enabled to cry, Abba, Father, Father, my Father. Timing is often, uh, as you know, vital to what happens in our lives or around us. Sometimes we talk about being in the right place at the right time. Um, way back, whenever it was, the Roman philosopher talking about luck said that luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. So we can be very prepared, but the opportunity doesn't arise, therefore frustrated. Or the opportunity arises and we're not prepared and we miss it. 
Now, in this particular instance, I, I believe, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I believe, from what little I do know, that the phrase is described as in God's chosen time. But the Greeks have a single word for that as well. So chronos is the word here, which is you know, progression of time, hours on the clock, etc., or watch. But kairos, which you may well have heard many times before, means in Greek, at the appointed time. So particularly when we think about the incarnation and Jesus coming to earth, um, kairos is God's chosen time. And in this um, short reading that we heard, it says, finally, to express, I suppose, how long the people of God have been waiting for the Messiah. I'm sometimes asked, you know, one of those questions I can't possibly answer, but over the years I've just got used to hearing the question and mumbling something of an answer is, why did Jesus come in the first century? Well, obviously it's the first century because Jesus came, but why did Jesus come there and then? And I honestly don't know. Uh, there are some people who say, oh, well, the Holy Roman Empire was used to, to spread Christendom, which is true. Uh, but is that why God came in Jesus? I have no idea. But sometimes we have to just try and discern what it is that God wants from us, um, as it were, here and now, in this moment. You know, one of the things that worries me the most is when someone comes up to me and says, God has told me, and then whatever they say. I'm normally very nervous at this point. Um, and what we do in the church is we tend to gather together to try to work out, to discern the will of God, as it were, as a group. So if someone says, I think God's calling me to be a minister, we don't just go, hooray, sign here, you know, uh, go to Tortable or whatever. Um, there's a whole process, and we call that a process of d a discernment process um, of affirming by the church, the whole church, as far as we can do, um, what it might be that God is calling us to do. And questions we ask are things like, why this, why here, and why now? Which, you know, obviously I can't answer those questions. But if we can come to some form of a mind over what it is that we're discussing, and it might even be that in a church council we've got a number of views, uh, and we try as far as we can, don't we, to discern the will of God uh, it's very hard. Sometimes it's so much easier to look back and say, oh yes, God wanted us to do X, Y, or Z. But at the time, we're in the midst of it all and we're just hoping and praying, and particularly praying, that we do uh, the right thing. And hopefully that's the thing that God wants us to do. Not always easy to tell. And then this thing I was saying about God. God isn't something you can describe and therefore you know, put it over here in the described box. Um, when I was growing up, I used to think about God as something that, you know, you could just decide to have in your life or not, you know, as if somehow God would just, just be moved out for special occasions and, and then I could relate to God. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth. Every single thing on earth, every, every life form, human or otherwise, exists in God and is created uh, by God. God is probably then, if you, if you remember your English at school, God is not really so much a noun as a verb. God is always acting. God is, the shortest way of describing God, God is love. Uh, and we know this supremely when we remember, especially as we've done recently through Christmas, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not die but may have eternal life. And we, re we heard this morning in that brief reading, God sent his own son. He came as the son of a human mother and lived under the Jewish law. It's, it's really important, I think, for us to, to grasp somehow um, that God has become one of us and that's what we remember at Christmas and that because God came as a human being God understands uh, exactly what it means um, for us to what we experience as humans but also uh, perhaps equally importantly is that it's not so much what we believe or what we say about what we believe 
but how we live our lives. Actions, as we know the old proverb, do speak louder than words. There's um, a letter of James that says this, um, My friends, what good is it for one of you to say that you have faith if your actions do not prove it? Can that faith save you? Suppose there are brothers or sisters who need clothes and don't have enough to eat. What good is there in your saying to them, God bless you, keep warm and eat well, if you don't give them the necessities of life? And so, as we were trying, as it were, to mirror and model what God has done by acting in our world, we need also as Christians to demonstrate God's love in us. And for me, this, this is perhaps illustrated by both when we're sorry and when we love. Um, when we're sorry as children, uh, we, we apologise to our parents eventually. Um, and as a parent, I, I know I've heard myself saying what my parents no doubt said to me, don't tell me you're sorry, show me. So show me by that you've learnt how not to do whatever it is again. And similarly with love, we can talk, and it's okay to talk about love and to tell each other we love each other. But of course, more important than speaking about love is the action, which first and foremost means being there. You know, being there for one another. Don't just tell me you love me, but be, be here with me. And that's what God did, isn't it, in Jesus? He sent his own son. He came to be here amongst us. He lived, he lived a life as a Jewish person under the Jewish law, um, but in a way fulfilling that law. And else you can see in the Bible places where Jesus said, I haven't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So he was obedient under the law, but demonstrated through his life that that was not the way to a relationship with God, just obeying all the rules as it were. If you want um, a little bit of context with the letter of the Galatians, they, they were um, a bunch of people who, what, what we might, the Bible calls Gentiles. So this Galatian group of churches has formed in an area that didn't formally um, have Judaism as its religion. So these people are not Jews who've become Christians or becoming Christians. These are people from outside of the Jewish faith as well. And so, of course, they were thinking to themselves, why do we need to follow these rules, such as circumcision or various things like that? Because those apply to Jewish people, but not necessarily to us. And Paul was siding with them. Um, and I understand the context is that the church in Jerusalem, the Christian church developing in Jerusalem, felt that everyone should be totally fulfilling all the Jewish laws as well, because that's what they were doing. And the letter, excuse me, the letter is in some ways uh, challenging that understanding that we need to obey the law, the rules, and the, and the letter is saying that it's by grace that we are enter his relationship with God through Jesus. So we are redeemed and we become God's children. I don't, the word redeemed is a weird word, isn't it? The only place I remember seeing it growing up as a child was on a piece of paper uh, that you might get from a garage or something, you know, when you were saving up to, to collect the uh, animal or whatever it was, the, the SO tiger, was it? Yeah. You, you want to save up you little bits of paper, you've got maybe so many gallons or whatever of petrol, and that used to say at the bottom of the thing, the, the redemption value, 0 0.0000001, in other words, not very much. And, and because in order to get whatever it was, you had to give something that at least had a nominal value. And that sort of redemption, so it's the same thing with um, Green Shield stamps, uh, and of course, um, not quite the same now, but we, uh, we now have the dividend on the co-op, etc. But the, re the redemption was handing something over and receiving something uh, in reply. And so you know that the word redemption is often used in, ter in ter terms of uh, Christian experience. But it's not a really helpful term, I don't think, because it, we tend to think of it as a transaction. And if we're not careful, we, we get to the mindset which says that people are bad, Jesus has come, 
Jesus must die for us. Um, because, although he wasn't bad, he can die in our place, and there's some kind of redemption transaction in all of that, which is very long and convoluted. And if you want me to <coughs> now, at some stage, we can talk about that a bit more uh, when we have more time to devote to that. But to me, the, what I want to just point out is the very real difference between being redeemed, which is great, um, and being adopted, which is what the passage tells us. That we don't just get redeemed and saved, but we become God's children. Now I have, or we have, Michelle and I, uh, and our children, um, first-hand experience of adoption, because of, you probably already know, but for those of you who don't know, our children are adopted. So until 2003, we didn't know them, and, uh, and then we had them come move in with us later in that year, and then a year and a half later, so 2004, um, they became our legal children and we became their parents. Now, one of the scariest moments of the court, the court proceedings, because um, the judge was dressed in a wig and all his robes, um, not, to, not to frighten me, but because uh, he asked the kids, um, do you want me to wear my robes? Oh, yes, they said. So he came in looking very much like a judge. And he turned to them at one point and said to, um, well, where were they? I think we were there, the kids were there, Gareth and Liam. Um, and he said to them, Gareth and Liam, um, do you want to live with Mr. and Mrs. Stringer forever? And I was thinking, oh, great. So I wonder what, if they say no, um, but thankfully they said yes, so that was good. Um, but the thing about adoption as opposed to redemption is that adoption, I believe, is forever. Um, we've become God's children, not just while you know, we're getting along, um, but we've become God's children forever. God will never let us go. Everyone, it says in the Bible, whom my Father gives me will come to me, says Jesus. I will never turn away anyone who comes to me. And that's in John 6. It's also important to recognise, and this is now different because of where we are and the times we live in, that in order to fully understand adoption in the first century, the phrase would have been sonship, not, not just being a child, but being a son, and more than that, being the first son. So becoming a child of God was like becoming the first son of God, which if you bear with me a moment, I, I don't think that's what I'm trying to say now. And uh, inheritance laws were very different then. I understand in Guernsey they were different here as well. Um, whereas I was brought up to think that um, inheritance means if there's three of you in the family, three children, you get a third of whatever it is each. That seems to me the, the, the way it goes. But that wasn't the case in the first century in Palestine. And so what we need to understand is that each one of us receives not just, oh, we're one of the family, but we may be you know, down, the, down the line somewhere. But each one of us is not only a child, but also an heir. So the inheritance is ours. And the inheritance, of course, from being a child of God is eternal life, not, not just living forever, but a life filled with meaning, uh, being in a direct relationship with God, which begins in this life and continues uh, forever and ever. And then the, the fourth thing I wanted to mention was about the Spirit of God. It's uh, all very well, and sometimes I'm aware that when, we're in, when I'm in preaching mode like this, there's a lot of words that are used, and sometimes we try to persuade people. I mean, I don't know why I'm trying to persuade you. You're already Christian. But, but we try to persuade people to be uh, stronger and hold their faith even more firmly. But there's something else about faith, which is nothing to do with our minds. Um, Jesus tells us that we must love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And we, we have got also um, to re relate to God on a very personal level. And in order to do that, God sends the Spirit, um, the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we might call it the Spirit of Jesus. But we um, have the Spirit in us so that despite all of the logic that may or may not sometimes work for us, there's, a, there's, there's the Spirit in us relating to the Spirit of God. And we refer to God not only as creator and, and all those other titles for God, but as, as the writer, as Paul says, here and also in Romans, that the Spirit allows us to call God Abba, 
father. And Abba is like daddy, daddy, father. I remember once um, I was at a, a group of ministers gathering in, in, in the UK. I think I was kind of about five years in ministry or thereabouts. And we had this meeting to see how we were all going. And they invited a Jewish um, a rabbi to come along and to share with us and some of his thoughts. Uh, and uh, in the bar afterwards, um, I remember he came up to us and said, I'm kind of um, envious of you Methodists. Um, I said, why is that? Because you're so pally with God. You know, we, we have God, you know, very revered and somehow distant. Um, he wasn't, you know, asking to become a Christian. He was just explaining for him the difference. So we seem to have this very personal relationship with God, and I'm glad that we do, because whilst it's good and always important to, to remember the almighty nature of, of Creator God, it's also essential to know that we have this relationship which is personal. And it's the spirit that God puts in us that is, enables us to declare um, that not only is God, God um, almighty, uh, invisible, and all those other things, but also our heavenly father. Which means that if God is our father, then we are brothers and sisters uh, to one another. We can know deep down, as it were, in our soul, or in our bones, wherever you want to put it, we, we know deep down that we are held by God, even when the evidence is slim. I mean, sometimes during life, I suspect, we do find it easier or harder to be Christian with whatever's going on in our lives. And I would say that at the hardest times, the, the, what gives us the opportunity to respond in faith is that spirit which God has placed in us. And it's only sometimes in moments of real testing that we feel this strength of this spirit. One of the um, early epithets or um, terms of abuse actually that Methodists received, um, on the one hand they were reasonable and they were rational, and on the other hand they were enthusiastic, and that was you know, deemed to be inappropriate. Uh, don't be too enthusiastic. Um, and one of the things that I discovered over time was the actual meaning of the word enthusiasm and in the middle of the word fuse is actually a slight corruption of the Greek theos. So enthusiasm means to have God within. What a lovely way um, to be a Christian, to be uh, infused by the Spirit of God. Uh, and the Bible tells us that the Spirit of God gives us power, enables us to love and uh, it also um, exercise self-control, uh, which is a handy thing to mention on the day before New Year's Day, when we're supposed to make uh, all our resolutions. So be encouraged that God has placed in you, in your hearts, and in my heart, the spirit which allows us to know God um, as Father, as Heavenly Father, to know each other as brothers and sisters. We have been saved, yes, we've been redeemed, but I think more importantly, and more personally, we have all been adopted and we are heirs to all the promises of God. God who is all loving, who is pure, unbounded love and compassion. And the God whose timing is perfect, even when sometimes I'm not sure um, how things are supposed to happen and when. Let us sing again the hymn 208. Let earth and heaven combine, angels and all agree.
language that Charles Wesley uses in his hymns. And I think there are some, some that are just amazing, some that are really odd, like the inextinguishable blaze, not a word we often use. But some of the phrases that he uses, I think, are almost as powerful as Shakespeare. Uh, at the end of that first verse, our God contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man. You know, just trying to put in some form of words and poetry the incredible attempt to understand that the invisible, almighty, um, immortal God for a period of time became restricted to live as a human being uh, in, in the way that we know is bringing us closer to God. We now make an offertory for God's work. <coughs> Almighty God, we worship you as the creator of all things. You made a world and you breathed life into it, including human life. We pray for a world which in some areas seems dark. We pray for countries and for their leaders where there is war. Pray for those who are afraid of the future, who are homeless. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for your church, church in different countries of different types, different denominations, we pray that we would not focus on difference, but focus on those things that we have in common. Supremely, your Son, in whose name we meet. So enable us to be one people, speaking with one voice to the world, that Jesus is Lord, Emmanuel, God with us. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We pray for the place that we live, for this bailiwick and this island, and all who work in the service of others. We pray for the emergency services. We pray for those who hold elected positions of influence, we pray that you would guide the hearts of women and men to do what they do for the benefit of us all, that we may live and continue in peace and harmony. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for those with whom we share in worship and community. We think particularly of those of our number who are not with us this morning, for whatever reason. For any who may be travelling, we pray 
for safe journeys. And for those who are unwell, we pray for recovery. And finally, Lord, we pray for ourselves, that you would so live in our hearts by your Spirit, that we would know, deep down, as it were, that we are loved by you, our Heavenly Father. We offer our prayers in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. We join our prayers together as we say the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Unto us a boy is born king of all creation. The hymn is number 218. Coming new year and always. Amen. 